there's this idea that the language of gesture and movement is far more important in human communication than verbal language, as in far more information relevant to survival is contained in our body language, gesture, facial expressions, tone of voice, breathing patterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the nonverbal streams. It's not only more important than language, but it's also far, far older than verbal language, right? I work with this idea that part of the evolution of verbal language, part of the evolution of human consciousness and human communication comes from this long, 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 long lineage of, of our ancestors communicating all the things like in John Young's stuff, right? Or Tom Brown's or whatever, these people, they do the sit spot and they do the story of the day. They say there's the sit spot and that's cool, but it's far more powerful if you share the story of your sit spot with other people, because then you're not just seeing things, you're seeing things with a level of detail that allows you to then describe them to someone else. And that, tr that attunes your nervous system, not just to the wall of green, but to the little details that are happening and their relationships to each other. If you know that you're going to have to tell someone the story of it, you have to put it together in a way that's more coherent in a different way. And so then we go, okay, so we come from a long lineage of people who have been telling the story of the day, maybe around the campfire, maybe whatever, telling the story of what was over the other hill, what happened, what, what, who was there, what creatures were there, what happened. And they've been telling those stories through, through gesture and body language and sound, through movement. So I really, I really give a lot of weight to this idea that the human species is a physical storytelling species in which one of the great foundations of our success as a species has been this ability to tell the stories of our environment through our bodies and our voice, meaning we've developed this in nature, completely uncanny, completely weird ability to take on the shapes and movements of all the other creatures and geological formations, the weather, like with our bodies, to take on the shapes and movements, depict the movements of wind with our body, mm -hmm. depict the shapes of rocks and mountains and all these other creatures. And that involves these body skills, which are separate. They're communicative and expressive, not just of physical information, but also of emotional content. And that this is a whole realm, a fundamentally important realm, which is essential, highly functional, but also very much aesthetic in that it's about how it looks and what emotions it conjures up. And it's separate to the skills. It's, it helps in some ways, but it's separate to the skills of moving through the environment, um, you know, the parkour, the, the wrestling kinds yeah. of skills. Welcome to the Evolve Move Play podcast, where we bring you the most interesting and enlightening conversations around movement practice and how you can become the most heroic version of yourself through pursuing movement that's relevant to your nature. This is a podcast that's going to feature some of the top movers in the world, some of the most amazing movement thinkers, and people from fields that are related to movement as far afield as evolutionary theory, strength and conditioning, and everything in between. So if you're interested in movement, please stick around. And if you like our work and want to support it, please consider supporting us on Patreon because this podcast is completely listener supported. We don't want to take any advertising. We don't want to interrupt your experience of watching the show. So what really helps us get the best thinkers on, have the time to put these together, have the best quality for you guys as far as audio and video is your support. So please consider supporting us and enjoy the rest of the show. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Evolve Move Play podcast. Today our guest is Simon Tacker. So Simon is an old friend of mine. He's one of my favorite people in the industry, one of the guys who's evolved a system that most parallels Evolve Move Play, but with many different influences that kind of fill in some of our gaps and we fill in some of their gaps. We've worked together. Uh, so yeah, Simon's great. We've had him on um, a couple of times before. Really interesting conversations. Um, so if you're not familiar with his work yet, go back and, and, and watch those to get an intro to them. This was quite an interesting conversation. Um, I've had a lot of business stuff going on right now and with coronavirus and everything going on. So I was not as prepared as I normally am. And I kind of went into it having to wing it, but it turned out extremely, extremely powerful. I think it was one of my favorite interviews that we've done. Um, we dug deep into the idea of aliveness and how it kind of 
interacts with the way that you design games and how you can grow as an athlete through well-designed games, um, how dance interacts with the ideas around aliveness, which is a question a lot of people have had from my previous uh, episodes about this. And we got into the idea of, um, of, of animal mimicry and tracking and, and the language of gesture and how all of this is built very deeply into us. Uh, so I think it's a really fascinating uh, episode. I think you guys are going to have a great time with it. Um, while I have you guys, um, before we get started, if you didn't know, we're offering an online program right now that is discounted 50% off for people to get started with a movement practice when they don't have access to a gym during the coronavirus situation. So, you know, we'll put the link in the podcast uh, notes. So if you are looking to get started and looking to get moving, now's a great time. And without further ado, Simon Tucker. Simon, it's wonderful to have you back on the show. Uh, you're one of my favorite people to talk to. Uh, oh, and, uh, last time, we said we were going to have another conversation soon. It's been a year. Um, I can't remember exactly what we talked about. My, my life's been crazy, so I'm not as caught yeah. up as I'd like to be. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna run with it, see what happens. Um, okay, sure. So let's start here. The last time we were talking, we were talking about the idea of aliveness, right? Mm. This was off camera talking about aliveness in an article that I recently wrote and the idea that all, all martial arts that have a kind of randori kind of open free play produce athletes who can fight. Right. And well-developed athletes in a lot of ways. Um, but some of them seem to transfer better than others. And not all of them make everything as alive as it could be. And we were speculating that one reason why um, wrestlers in particular seem to excel in MMA is not because wrestling as a competitive format is a better base than jujitsu as a competitive format or kickboxing as a competitive format, but because wrestlers have a pedagogy based on aliveness that penetrates beyond just the competitive format, but also to the way that they build their skills. So I called you to specifically ask about that because I know you'd studied wrestling more than me. So I, 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 I'm curious to hear you, you talk a little bit more about that and you know, what your take is on that. I should definitely begin by, by uh, noting that I'm like a, a crappy wrestler who started far too late in life. Um, so, you know, there are, like any anything I say about wrestling, it's like I I love it and I've like I've dived into it a couple of times, um, and, and dealt with some injuries and dived back into it and so on. And I'm just comparing it to my previous background with other other movement arts and capoeira and those sorts of things. So I'm far from it. Um, I'm the opposite of an authority on wrestling. One of the things I've noticed most about wrestling is um. So in 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 Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which I which I've I, I continue to study and I'm, I'm doing a lot more of these days since um, I got a, a, a really severe knee injury when you were there at the retreat several mm -hmm. years ago. So that kind of put a, that put a, a stop you to my um, When you got that injury. From wrestling. Yeah. 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 You so were, that, you were, uh, it's a classic mistake actually. I, who, who are, who was it you were wrestling with? It was a young guy. It was, um, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, Wondering if I should name him online, but it's, he <laughs> might be enough to name him. Anyway, it was Andrew Mills. Okay, Andrew Mills. Yeah. Oh, not such a young guy, but a bit of a bull in a china shop sometimes. No offense, well, Andrew. He was, very, you. No, he was very enthusiastic and very experimental because of his contact improv background. So yeah, he tangled up my leg with his leg, and we were on unstable <laughs> ground in the bush, and you know we lost our balance. Both of our body weights went through my knee as it was twisting, and it was a it was a bad time. Yeah, and then you. Um, we hung out for the rest of the week without getting any treatment. Yeah, yeah, but I fixed that's, my knee. It's great. That's how but it just meant that, um, you know, my stand-up, I developed a considerable amount of apprehension to aggressive stand-up wrestling, and jujitsu is much safer. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you're closer to the ground. But um, anyway, so I was going to say that in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, just in the time that I've been doing it, um, over the last ten years or so. People have been upgrading more and more and more into the, like, rather than just drilling techniques and then free rolling, mm -hmm. people have been going more and more and more into this idea of limited games, where you have a small game 
based around a limited like set of constraints and you worked within that to develop your like specific skills in a like a, a higher you get a higher density of practice in that in that limited game and it seems like in wrestling that kind of limited game has been used in wrestling training for a much longer period of time i have no idea about the history of wrestling training really in mm-hmm. in different countries it's different but it, it's right right from my very first exposure we had a lot of um you know you just practice your pummeling drills you'd just be pummeling for underhooks head position you know and then just adding in duck unders or just adding in single leg like over and over and over and over and over and you're not doing the full sport you're just doing this little limited limited skill or parterre drills where you're just working on the pin and the pin escape um and as we've been finding in jiu-jitsu those limited games are just far better for um retention of the skills that you've just been practicing and for uh getting many 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 more instances of like spotting opportunities for that particular skill and capitalizing on that opportunity so i really think that that's um that's been one of the major strong points of wrestling is that it's of course it's huge in terms of the number of potential techniques and and skills and stuff but the the basic elements that you're working on all the time are, are limited enough that that people can get amazing at the fundamentals of wrestling in a in a relatively short time and then go on to develop this huge enormous level of complexity on top of that yeah so yeah that, that's that accords with what i'm thinking and uh it's quite it's kind of interesting that you're saying that you've, you're seeing more of that in jiu-jitsu so i recently had matt thornton on the podcast are you familiar with Matt Thornton? Um, I know his name and I've seen, I think he's got a YouTube channel that I've seen a bunch and I've read some articles that he's written. Yeah. 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 So my jujitsu background started under a, well, I started under a, an army ranger in a shed for a year and a half when I was 16. But when I went back and started training more seriously in my twenties, yeah. it was under one of Cody, uh, one of uh, um, Matt's students, Cody Houston. And so I was introduced to jujitsu through the SP, straight blast gym system. Um, so in the movement community, a lot of people are familiar with Ido Portal's I system of, of movement development. Isolate, integrate, improvise. Yep. Well, Matt had independently proposed something like this much earlier, and he called it introduce, isolate, and integrate. And I've been very frustrated when I've gone into jiu-jitsu because very frequently the way that it's taught is here is a random skill of the day um you get to drill it without any resistance for five minutes and then we'll show a variation of it and then we'll show another variation of it and then we'll show another variation of it and that takes half an hour uh or 45 minutes and then the last 15 minutes of the of the class you live spar that is the Mm -hmm. the default kind of jujitsu class yeah and based on my own research in the play world and in uh, constraint led learning approaches, et cetera. I'd really come to this idea that, that a lot of that dead drilling of patterns isn't very useful. Um, and that if you can constrain the game in such a way that you're seeing the same problem in a live way, one thing you didn't really mention in the, in your description of that is that all those games, the wrestlers play are mostly competitive, right? There's a goal and there's a way to win. It's just not the whole game. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're still trying to hold the pin. You're not just, you know, there's a, there's a difference between like practicing uh, lop sao, chi sao patterns. Yeah. Actually trying to, you know, really pummel through and get control. And totally. they're, they're doing this. And um, so as I was reading and listening to Matt and I realized that I had been mistaken in the way that I understood his, his proposal. What he means by isolate is precisely that. Isolate mm-hmm. is when you introduce a live game that is sufficiently constrained that allows you to look specifically at a technique or principle that right. you can isolate. Yeah. And interestingly, he told me that he got that from Hickson, that mm. Hickson Gracie uh, calls mm. that positional sparring and that right. in, um, in Matt's experience, only Hickson and Hodger Gracie teach like this huh. um, of any of the major schools of Jiu-Jitsu that he's, he's run into. And then he mm. from 
from Hickson. Mm. Um, now, I, I forgot to ask Matt, Matt this, uh, but I'm kind of interested in the idea that, that Hickson himself might have picked it up from his brother Holes, because Holes Gracie was one of Hickson's major teachers, and Holes studied American grappling. He studied wrestling. He brought wrestling into jiu-jitsu. Uh -huh. It might even be a lineage into the aliveness and the, the, the uh, isolation that actually goes back all the way to American wrestling once again. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's totally speculative. I don't know enough about jujitsu. Nobody should take me as an authority there, but I just happened to have heard about this and my brain made these connections. Right. But, but I think that it's, it's, it's really profound because the idea here is that if we want to learn something, we need to set up a game that allows mm. us sufficient exposure to the thing with mm. sufficient safety and chance of success that we can learn a lesson that's specific to that. The problem is like, you know, if I, like my game in jujitsu is that I'm really good at, um, at passing, uh, like taking top position and at 215 pounds and very athletic, most people will just seed me top position. It's like I push on them and they're gonna go to their guard and let me come over yeah. top. So I get top position, I pass the guard, and then I'll threaten with a collar choke or a Kimura um, or a key lock. And mm -hmm. then usually I'll get someone to extend an arm or roll to their back. And then I'll take an arm bar or mm -hmm. a rear naked choke. So 90% mm -hmm. of the time when I finish, it's one of those two uh, attacks from, from the top, right? All right. Uh, so now if you teach me a heel hook or, or a, an, a straight ankle lock, right? in class uh you know or or a complex omoplata attack from the bottom mm. i have to go way out of my way to try to make that happen and if the other guy doesn't want to let me go way out of that way right like if he's like i'm really playing guard it just doesn't happen so you have to you yeah. have to manipulate the game um yeah. so this is this is what i'm particularly interested in right now and you know right uh, is how we think about c game constructions that mm. cause this. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that, um, so coming from a, a Capoeira Angola background, particularly, where um, we do, we have a similar, a similar way of training in that um, most of the really old school Capoeira Angola has very few movements, very few, specifically trained movements like that are named and so on and um as in wrestling as in capoeira in modern in the modern games they do drill the basics thousands of times because you you create this basic uh vocabulary yeah and because it is a traditional art then there's like the, the shape of the negativa there's the principle of the negativa of the avoiding of a, a certain kick but then there's the shape of the the negativa which has a different lineages have a particular shape which like shows ah that's the that's from Jean Piquet or that's from um Jean Grangi or or you know you 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 see the tradition in the particular shapes that they take on which is a beautiful thing um but then in the Capoeira Angola we have this idea and not all teachers teach this way but this is by far my favorite way of like you train the minimum number of movements which will allow you to create a game and so you can before people have learned how to jinga you can teach them habuji ahaya like one of the basic um spinning sort of uh attack kind of movements the negativa which is the traditional response to that movement and then maybe you add in an au or a cabezada or a tizora like a scissors anyone but you just create these you take these three movements which you can teach people in like 10 minutes 20 minutes depending on you know five minutes depending on their background or whatever and then you say okay now we play a game where you just you know you respond you never you never you never block the force in Kapoor Angola right if there's a movement coming towards you 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 sway you sway with it you go under it and you show people that with just Habuji Ahaya Negativa and Au, three movements, and in a game between two people in a very confined space where they're 
you can't run away. You're always in each other's space, that you can have an infinite game, infinite game out of three movements between two people. And because the space is confined, you're always responding spatially. It's this spatial problem solving. You're not, you're not, uh, you're not making up a sequence of moves. You're responding spatially to the other person. And so my preferred way of teaching Kapoor Angola is to start even one step back where we begin with an equivalent of like the game that Ido popularized under the name Zen Archer. Mm-hmm. We are just avoiding each other, but in a super, super confined space. And we add the Kapoor element of you're only allowed to touch the ground with your hands, your feet and your head. And then you weave in and out of each other in a tiny, tiny, tiny space and just get this idea of moving through the negative space that's offered by your partner. Yeah. And then once we've played that game, then we add just Habujia Haya Negachiba. So then they're, and then they're getting thousands, thousands of, of opportunities and successful responses to these spatial stimuli and their bodies are responding appropriately. And so then when I think about, you're following what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, absolutely, yeah. And you start with not even any of the movements of Capoeira, but you start with this negative space game. And within minutes, they're doing things that look like Capoeira. Then you add just one traditional attack, the Habu Jihaya, and one traditional defense, the Nega Chiva, the ducking under the kick. And you just add that. And then people in like a 15-minute, half-an-hour session, they look like they've been playing Capoeira Angola for years. Yeah. Um, which is wonderful. Is, yeah, this is what we've discovered with like parkour, right? Like, um, right. We we've seen people be able to develop skill and look so smooth in parkour movements within the course of our week long retreat by starting them. We've broken it down to basically like if you take that the the idea of the I method as 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 uh, Matt talks about it. Yeah. We add the element of exploration as the first thing. Right. Right. So rather than introduce you to um, a skill and then mm-hmm. integrate it, what we do is we try to set an environment, a, a set of challenges that will invite you into a skill. Mm-hmm. Once you start expressing those skills, and let's give an example. So a really classic one is we'll find two tree branches or a couple of rails and say, go under one and go over the other. Mm-hmm. Right. Tree branches work really, really well because they're a little less intimidating, uh, you know, if they're like nice and low to the ground, but this works with rails too. Most people, when asked to do that, will do some kind of like side monkey or pasada as they call it in, uh, in, in Capoeira to go under at some point. They might do a spinning move under, they might do a butt spin to go over, they might do a roll to go under. And yep. as they go over, they will do a step fault They'll do like a swinging over action. They'll do a spinning over action. And, yeah. you know, largely without any instruction, all of that space will be explored, especially if you have like a young, healthy athlete. Like my son is five yeah. years old. Um, he went out to train with me or play with me uh, on Tuesday. And we found this really cool, low, very thick and very stable rail. And mm-hmm. he just started trying different ways of going over it. and you know, essentially he tried all the ways of going over it that his little body could do. And uh, it was funny because I did coach him a little bit, but I was trying to like hold myself back, just like, shut up, Rafe. Like he, he's got it in his body. He doesn't need, he doesn't need all, if I interfere with him, like maybe I'll help him, but maybe also I'll, I'll, I'll steal his process. Mm. Maybe he's in love with what he's doing and he's having fun. And just because he's having fun, he's going to do it. But if I come over and say, oh, do it like this, then maybe he did it wrong and he's, he's discouraged. Yeah. If I just leave him alone, and it's really hard for me because I've been a coach for so long and because like, I'm so proud of him and I love it. But it's like yeah. every time I'm watching him move, like, I'm like, shut up. <laughs> shut yeah. up, Rick. Just let him move. Right? But he yeah. did it, right? He did a lazy vault. He did a step vault. He did a flank vault. He did a cash vault with one hand above, right? Um, on like a higher surface. He's just like figuring it out. Um, and, and so, and we see the same thing with our students, right? If we give them this space, most of them will explore sort of a variety of solutions. Once they find one thing, they kind of want to explore the other things. Their brains automatically start generating solutions. 
um, and exploring the parameter space. So now as they do that, we'll be like, oh, that's a step fault. That's the start of a lazy fault. That's right. the start of a reverse fault pattern, right? Yeah. Or yeah. a side monkey pattern, right? As we call them. Then yeah. what we'll do is we'll isolate and say, what we like to do is ideally introduce the fundamentals at this stage, right? Mm. So before we, because there's a problem with getting caught in the vocabulary as the, as the idea, right? So right. Can you, can you do this with, with good rhythm? Can you do it with good control of your direction of inertia and your displacement over the object? Uh -huh. And then we show how the, that, that pattern that you just used works really well in this context to achieve that fundamental goal. Mm. Um, so then you can go to now try to, what happens when you try it in these different contexts? What happens when you right. have these different movements in front of it? And then, uh, then the, the levels above that are, well, can you do it when you're stressed? Can you do it when you're tired? Can you do it with more power, right? Like that's um, mm. like, how do you load the movement? And then the last thing is, can you do it in a game, right? Right. Can you do it reactively and, you know, uh, yeah. not volitionally. So that's our pedagogy. Um, One of the things that I was thinking in terms of um, in terms of martial arts, like wrestling stuff, is um, and and jujitsu or whatever. Also, is um, when we're when we're making up these these games, like some of them are, you know, like like you say, we can if we. We can start with the, like, rather than starting with uh, the technique, if we start with the the outcome, and say, okay, like, so maybe we're like we're pummeling for underhooks, and it's like you try and get you're trying to get two underhooks and link your arms behind the other person, and then just go to it, and people will start doing all sorts of things, all sorts of things, and um. And they'll work out things which turn out to be traditional wrestling techniques, but also they turn out to be the same moves that koalas do when they wrestle or any creature does when they wrestle that has two arms, right? And a neck. Yeah. Um, and so um, the outcome will often just simply allow the, the, the skill to manifest naturally, which you can then refine later. But um, also you could like play a game where it's like, okay, you start, in, a, in the pummeling drill or you start in a, a, a collar tie or head arm tie or whatever. And it's like, okay, you've got now, you know, you're trying to get, you're trying to touch the ankle. Like we've played some of these games. Yeah. You're trying to touch, you're trying to tap I them on the ankle. A lot that I learned from you. Or, you're, or you're trying to grab a leg. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, both partners are trying to grab a leg and they're both, both partners are then getting better at stopping their legs from getting grabbed. But so I think, the most interesting games start to come when you add a pair of opposite options because um, like, you know, if you're just trying to stop underhooks, then one great way to do it is just to like drop your head down and, and push them away. Um, and if you're just trying to stop them getting your legs, then of course the best thing to do also is, is sprawl. Yeah. Right. Is sprawl your legs back, and then you can just get two people with their legs sprawled back, like a pair of, um, you know, animals biting heads, and their feet are back, and like the learning can sort of stop there. It's like, okay, you've both now mastered the art of blocking the other person, and if we keep the game in this limit, then that stops. <laughs> so then you add one more element, which is the opposite, which is, for example, the snap down, where if they've dropped their head down, now you, now you you pull their face towards the ground. And so the the perfect defense against one thing now is the perfect opportunity to do the opposite thing. And then when they defend against that by pulling their head back up, that's the perfect opportunity to go for their legs. And so then you add this game where you have two possible responses, the defense for which opens you up into the other. And these games, I feel like these are the ones which really develop our skill where we learn to switch back and forth between these two fundamental skills we switch back and forth and it's like you stop one and stop the other and you go for one go for the other um and whether that's a left and right switch or an up and down switch or a forwards and backwards switch but those are the those are the um i think those are the games that develop our skill the quickest because another thing that i've noticed happening in jiu-jitsu is if we introduce a game 
like where we're practicing, like just going for the single leg, or if we're practicing just going for one particular sweep from the bottom, if it's just that one sweep and they know that that's the one we're practicing, it's virtually impossible to ever get it. Yeah, you but need- if it's that one sweep and they block that and you go the other way, then even if they know, because in real, in any good sport, yeah. both partners know what's going on really, really well. And the th- real challenge is how quickly can you switch? Yeah. So switching, you know, and it's, it's like, like oppositional, right. You have oppositional yeah. goals that, yeah. that, that make it so there's an opportunity for that for a stalemate not to be created right yeah so a, a game i like we play a game called torso tag right as an introduction to striking using a soft hand or your fingers you just have to tap someone on the torso and this is a fun game um, but if you add um ta- that they can tag each other's feet with their feet um, mm-hmm. then you get this oppositional attention thing right yeah and yeah. then it's developmental for when you get into uh kickboxing because it's the same thing where very often i'm using my hands to set up my kicks or i'm using my kicks to set up my hands yeah. um, and so it turns out that whenever i'm going for whenever my attention is on your hand or my attention is on my hand at reaching your your uh, your chest it's very easy for me to leave my feet right mm. vulnerable or um or you know as i step in to get you you know my foot is usually there right mm. so being able to to have awareness of where that space is and ranges of the feet is really useful. Now, this is not a real combative drill. It doesn't look like fighting, um, right? but it teaches these fundamental awarenesses and, and abilities of the perceptual system, mm. organizational system. So um, what I wanted to, to, to touch on to, you know, we can come back to this, but I want to touch on this earlier is uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of, principle-based training versus technique-based training. I've been thinking about this in reference also to the idea that a lot of the way that we teach, that we have taught movement over the last, say, 100 years, has been built on a schema-based model of motor control, right? Mm. We have we have analogized human beings to machines and we've analogized the mind to a computer and so we've had this model of motor control where it's like, um, it's like building a pathway through the brain, right? Mm-hmm. And you have a, cent- a central pathway. And so this is why you stand and practice kata or you stand and, you know, hit the air over and over and over again. The idea is that, you know, like Bruce Lee famously said, if you're not the man who's practiced a thousand punches, fear the man who's practiced one punch a thousand times. Mm. But one punch a thousand times doesn't get you anything if you don't have it perceptually coded to when a punch is available against another opponent. So it's like a thousand sparring situations or a thousand different sparring opponents is a much better guide. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've had this model and, uh, and I was actually thinking about this in reference to Capoeira because it seemed, because there's a lot of directions we can go with this, but it seems to me that Heishonam, is in some ways the it, it, it's kind of like, or it appears to me that what happened with Haitian now was that they brought in this theory of pedagogy that mm. looked like the traditional Asian martial arts, which yeah. were influenced by European ideas about pedagogy, which had right. come out of the Industrial Revolution. Because it's like we think that karate people have been standing and, and striking in a room full of people forever. And maybe they have, but I'm not sure that that's the case. I think that there was this that's whole, like it. Yeah. I think there was this whole militaristic industrial approach to movement that was popularized yep. at the end of the 19th century as modern. Yep. And that, that was adopted into those martial arts. And then that yep. was what was passed on. And it seems to me that, uh, that Hezhenel kind of took that on. Right. Yep. And so what we find, interestingly, because I, right from the beginning of my capoeira, like, learning, like, of course, I loved the movements of Heijanal. They were the first ones I saw on um, Tekken, Tekken 2, Tekken 3, yeah. whichever it was, it was with, with Eddie. Yeah. Um, but, like, you know, the cool kicks and the flips and stuff. But then what I found straight away 
once I discovered Capoeira Angola compared to Capoeira Hegional was that was that in Hegional and it's not real Hegional this is all really what they call contemporary yeah. contemporary Capoeira um because the actual Hegional from Bahia yeah has none of the problems I'm about to describe okay. but that in what I thought was Hegional at the time people because most of us were beginners were like standing far apart mm -hmm. looking for an opportunity to do to perform a movement like mm -hmm. i want to perform this trick and that wait until the person had moved away enough that they had room to do their big flying spinning kick or yeah. whatever so there was very little weaving in and out there was very little spatial responsiveness and everyone was thinking they were in their heads going i want to do my move i want to do my move whereas in the angola there was a lot more movement in the Hegenal. People were jumping in one after the other for like three seconds at a time to do their fanciest move in the Angola. Two people were playing in close proximity for five minutes nonstop or 10 minutes nonstop. Or sometimes we would play for like 20 minutes, half an hour nonstop, just two people in each other's space. And there's much more movement, like, like creatively responding to each other's facial expressions to each other's like constant faking, constant breaking of rhythm, dropping into rhythm, breaking of rhythm, all of this stuff, so a much more rich interaction, which I really liked. Whereas in the Hegenal, with the training method of repeatedly doing, repeatedly drilling your movements, then in the game, people were essentially just trying to perform the movements just as they had practiced them. And it's um, it's a perfect example, I think, of uh, the almost like the robotification of of these movement skills, like you're saying, like training it as if, as if you're a machine. And then it's like, you go and the purpose is to do the movement rather than the purpose being to respond intelligently to an extremely complex, semi-predictable situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think about the idea that, you know, a lot of what's termed movement culture now mm. is essentially movements from capoeira that are divorced from their game. Yeah. Combined with elements of dance and hand balancing and gymnastic strength. Yeah. Um, and there's some beautiful things in the combination of that. Mm. But it seems to me that if the goal is to produce people who move really well in the sense of being able to solve movement problems. Right. That actually Capoeira, especially Angola, had mm. more of a movement culture than movement culture does. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, uh, I, it's easy to bang on on Ido because he's the, you know, he, he's the he's the biggest ten, right? It's like, you know, tw uh, ten years ago, everyone is going to have their opinion about how cra crappy CrossFit is because uh -huh. know, it, it's what everyone can see. But mm -hmm. I thought that Ido said it himself in one of his interviews in a way that was really, uh, you know, he said it's not what kind of muscles you have, it's what kind of patterns you have. Uh -huh. that's that's the that's kind of the the epitome of this idea the the karate like how many katas can you learn how many right. kicks can you do how much yeah. movement vocabulary do you have and yeah. um, i think that when we look at what makes really great athletes great mm. it's not that it's how well exactly. they can solve movement problems exactly and so that's the wrong it's the wrong thing and i you know i think that um I don't think that that one statement of Ito's is necessarily uh, representative of everything he, that he thinks and that he of does course. other interesting things, but this is just, yeah. it, it was just a moment and I see this in, in this yeah. modern movement culture. Well, have you noticed, like I'm, I'm regularly stunned when I see that like most of the people who like, who I, I learned jujitsu from, who I, who I train with like, and like, who I'd like, like champion, champion jujitsu people who I, whose instructional material I study. And like, these are physical, physical geniuses. These are really, really skilled, intelligent people. And like, when I, when I roll with these guys like that, and when I watch them, it's like, man, they are amazing. But their solo movement looks like shit. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like they haven't trained this beautiful sort of 
movement oh. awareness of a dancer, which we get, we see from people like Ido and, you know, like we get from, we think those of us who are from this movement world, we often think that like the skill and grace and, and fluidity and coordination of your solo movement shows how good you are. But these guys like their solo movement looks rubbish. They look stiff. They look uncomfortable. You know, they look uncoordinated, but you put them in a, in a bout friendly or competitive with someone else and all their skills show and their movement is, is exceptional mm -hmm. in context. Yeah. You know what I mean? So we've, we've got the, we've got the skill and the context like mixed up in some of our, uh, in our desire, particularly with, with video these days. Like, again, if you look at some of the old video of movement, like judo masters and like amazing people from like 50, 60 years ago or like hundred years ago, black and white footage, their solo movement is like clunky and like horrible when looked at from our modern aesthetic standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. It's interesting. I mean, I think there are, you see athletes who have it both, right? Like yeah. you watch Anderson Silva just move right. in the context that you want and it's going to totally. blow away. Yeah. Um, but like Keith Jardine, you know, not the same level of fighter, but a, a very good fighter. I don't know if people can go look him up, but his movement aesthetically was just, it was appalling. Right. But he was a great fighter. You know, he was a top yeah. four fighter in the world at one point. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, Marshawn Lynch, who is a NFL running back here in the Seattle Seahawks, one of the best running backs of the last 15 years. Um, you know, he would fail like every assessment of mobility and stability, et cetera, that you wanted to throw at him. You know, he, he was a little bit kind of chubby and, you know, but you put him on a football field and he would do things that you just couldn't imagine were possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Like he, he's, he's, I mean, he was incredibly physically powerful, but his, mm -hmm. his vision and his, his determination and the way that he moved and the way that he solved problems was something else. Right. So I think, I think it's true. I think you can unite them. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, this is what I was just about to, um, what I was about to add was that um, in like in Arnhem Land, for example, in the, um, the indigenous communities that um, we've, we've spent some time with the last couple of years um, with our friends from, uh, from, from nature philosophy, Kate and Sam, uh, where we, we grew up in, in this super remote community, super traditional culture. And so the people, they're still hunters. They still like walk and, and run and, and throw, like they, they go spear fishing, like throwing spears and getting fish. Like, and so all of these things, all of these like um, what we're talking about, the skill in context mm -hmm. is massively highly developed just through interaction with the environment. Like the, the way these people walk, is phenomenal, like completely unhurried, super relaxed, but they're, they're flying through the landscape. Their, 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 their ability to avoid and pick terrain like completely unconsciously, amazing. Their ability to spot little flickers of shadow in the water, or I don't even know what they're seeing because I just totally cannot see it, but they're spotting fish and nailing them with a spear and all this sort of stuff. So their skills fully adapted to the context and their traditional dance, is incredible. They've grown up dancing. They've grown up with physical expression and like these, these sorts of body awareness. So it's like, like this sort of, this sort of thing of athleticism and natural movement and stuff being some of the, some of the missing ingredients. Yeah, sure. But also I really think that the dance in the, in the sort of full movement development, like some, some form of dance yeah. is, um, you, I would never say anything's essential, but it's like, it's fundamental as well in uh, in human movement skill. There is an aesthetic element to it. So the, this is an interesting question for me. So I've been thinking a lot about, uh, there's a couple things that have been really on my mind recently. One is, uh, is efficiency, right? Like the Pareto problem, right? I'm, I'm 38 now. I've got big demands on me business-wise. I've got three small children who need my time. I've got lots of different training goals. And it, you know, if it's not the most efficient path, then I don't want to do it. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm like, like putting everything that I do under a microscope and saying, can I get this benefit by doing something else slightly differently? Or do I need this? 
So everything's about this. And as I've looked at, uh, um, you know, one thing, you know, when you talk about those, those hunter foragers, right, who live this way, you say they move differently because they perceive differently. Mm. And this is the huge and fundamental thing. That, one of the huge and fundamental things that I'm really focusing on in my work is that control of movement is always a perceptual problem as well as a motor problem. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is that when you practice movement skills in isolation without rich perceptual information for that skill to be attuned to, uh, yep. you don't get that, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, in the, in the motor learning research is called perception action coupling. And the big thing in uh, skill design is how do you get it to be representative enough so that you're getting the right types of information. So if I punch in, in the air, there's no fidelity to the to the punching another person is trying to punch me back. I have to create enough fidelity between those two things. I have to have the right information in my environment to attune me to, to do it. Um, and how, how, how extraordinary our attunement can be and is not mm. has also mm. become really apparent to me through, um, I've been reading What the Robin Knows by John Young recently. Cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been going out and doing my sit spot meditation. Nice. Yeah. And so I'm sitting out there and I'm listening to the birds. Yeah. And I'm realizing, for instance, that there's, there's two toeys near my sit spot. Uh -huh. When they do their companion call, I cannot locate them. My mind, I can visually perceive one. So there's one that I've seen and know somewhere where he is in the environment. And then his mate is somewhere else in the environment, but I've never seen her. Mm -hmm. And he'll call and then she'll call. They're saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, okay? When I hear her call, I hear it as coming from him. Mm. Because my, my, my visual perceptual system is mm -hmm. overriding whatever information is coming in. It says, yep. I know that there's a bird there, so now that sound is coming from there. Yeah. Now, if I continue to do this long enough, my brain will be able to geographically represent those sounds and, and mm. locate them. But that's a sensitivity that develops. And so these people who, who are moving and living in these environments, they can become attuned to all this information that we're completely blind to. That's the same thing for information in, in, uh, in the, the visual information in the environment. Like, what, what does this patch of forest say to you about where you can put foot? And is it safe yep. to put your foot down? And what kind exactly. of traction will you get? And will it break a stick? Like yep. there's, there's vast levels of sophistication that we don't have access to because we don't do it. Yeah. I've been thinking about this in reference to like jumps in parkour. Mm. Um, there's this, one of the most beautiful articulations of the kind of like archetypal idea of parkour that I've ever heard was Jerome Vere said, parkour is is about becoming the man who runs and whom nothing can stop. Mm. But that implies that you can start running and whatever obstacle occurs to you, you can overcome. But parkour mm -hmm. athletes almost never practice running and then overcoming the obstacle as it occurs to them. They go to an obstacle, calibrate themselves on it, and then, and then go. And so there's a, there's a whole different perceptual thing that happens when you look at an object, measure it out, walk it out with your feet, jump at it a few times and calibrate mm. versus can I train my nervous system to pick up the spatial relationship between two objects as I'm running at it. Mm. Right? So I've been giving myself these challenges where if I see a jump that is um, within my range, uh, and doesn't look too dangerous. Yeah, I will try to run at it the first time and jump yeah. it precisely. Um, and I will deny myself these other forms of information because I'm trying to get my nervous system to be able to pick up the information that would allow me to do those kind of jumps if a tiger was chasing me and mm -hmm. I saw that jump for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so okay <laughs> I, I, i'm super passionate about what i was just sharing so i got a little bit uh, on a tangent here so okay so if if if, if so basically from my perspective now 
the, the movements that I've identified as like at the heart of what I would call the universal athletic blueprint. Right. Because parkour is basically, um, there's a way to make parkour even better than it is. But parkour as it is, I think is better than every other form of primary locomotive training because mm. it has this aspect of attuning you to the environment. Yep. It has this task constraint where you go out and you attune yourself to a given movement environment and you do that over and over again. So you're always getting novel information. So you're getting the most robust yep. movement system. Yep. It's like the difference between sparring the same guy for 10 years and sparring mm. a different guy all the time. Mm. Like you're going to be a more robust fighter you're going to see how to fight much more by having fought more people. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, doing a running long jump into the same pit and the same run up every time isn't going to produce yeah. a robust jumping athlete. And doing you know, your tumbling runs on the same exact surfaces in the gym right. doesn't produce this. So, so parkour is your locomotive foundation. And then mm -hmm. uh, martial arts, obviously. And the more alive, the better. And then also I've been very intrigued by the idea of team sports because mm. you have this necessity for hand-eye coordination, for catching and moving and manipulating objects and for also for moving with other people. Right? Yeah, yeah. Traditional martial arts is man versus man. But like if you're in a self-defense situation, like a big brawl has broken out in a city and maybe you're there with your buddies, like maybe you need to wedge up and push through some people and rugby is going right. to Right. Yeah. Maybe yeah. You know, like there's a lot of self-defense. There's a lot of physical skill that happens in those field sports. Yeah. And obviously. Okay. Maybe you need to throw, throw something, catch something. All these have that perception action coupling. And as much as possible, I think we should have these representative game designs and we should hybridize these things so that your, your parkour is taking you here and there. Okay. Very long preamble. The thing that I doesn't quite fit into my model is dance. Mm. Mm. Where is the perception action coupling? Mm. How does it attune you to these fundamentals mm. that, that make you better at movement in general? Because it mm. seems like it does, but it doesn't quite fit the theory. Um, mm. I just recently learned that Israel Adesanya, you know who Israel Adesanya is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe the best striker in UFC and in, in mixed martial arts in the world right now. He didn't pick up uh, martial arts until he was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. He was a pop and locker in high school. Right. Yeah. Decided for who, God knows whatever reason to become an MMA fighter, walked into uh -huh. the gym and a week later took his first fight. Mm. But he has this, you know, you, you want to talk about a guy who has movement that is beautiful as well as movement that is solution oriented. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking specifically of him. <laughs> there like you go. A few minutes ago. Yeah. Okay. So, so I've laid out my thesis. And I've laid out, here's my hole. You are just telling me that, mm. that you think that, that dance is a key part of this. So yeah. what am I missing? How do, we, how do we integrate dance into this perspective? So, um, you know, I've got this, I've got this, um, this idea, this, this, this working, working model, this hypothesis that, um, that I've, been following which is you know it's coming from coming from a bunch of different streams and um it's speculative but it's there's a lot of support for it in um in research from a bunch of different fields but basically that um there's this idea that the language of gesture and movement is um, far more important in human communication than verbal language, as in far more, far more information relevant to survival is contained in our body language, gesture, facial expressions, tone of voice, breathing patterns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the nonverbal streams. Yeah, I mean, I can... And that's that's and that it's so not only it's not only more important than language but it's also far far older than verbal language right and then a related idea so that first idea is already is already huge it's like going okay so we've been communicating through gesture and movement and body language for far longer than we've had verbal language in our species then i have this this um 
I work with this idea that part of the evolution of verbal language, part of the evolution of human consciousness and human communication comes from this long, 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 long lineage of, of our ancestors communicating all the things like in John Young stuff, right? Or Tom Brown's or whatever these people, they do the sit spot and they do the story of the day. They say there's the sit spot and that's cool, but it's far more powerful if you share the story of your sit spot with other people, because then you're not just seeing things, you're seeing things with a level of detail that allows you to then describe them to someone else. And that, tr that attunes your nervous system, not just to the wall of green, but to the little details that are happening and their relationships to each other. If you know that you're going to have to tell someone the story of it, you have to put it together in a way that's more coherent in a different way. And so then we go, okay, so we come from a long lineage of people who have been telling the story of the day, maybe around the campfire, maybe whatever, telling the story of what was over the other hill, what happened, what, what, who was there, what creatures were there, what happened. And they've been telling those stories through, through gesture and body language and sound, through movement. So I really, I really give a lot of weight to this idea that the human species is a physical storytelling species in which one of the great foundations of our success as a species has been this ability to tell the stories of our environment through our bodies and our voice, meaning we've developed this in nature, completely uncanny, completely weird ability to take on the shapes and movements of all the other creatures and geological formations, the weather, like with our bodies, to take on the shapes and movements, depict the movements of wind with our body, mm -hmm. depict the shapes of rocks and mountains and all these other creatures. And that involves these body skills, which are separate. They're communicative and expressive, not just of physical information, but also of emotional content. And that this is a whole realm, a fundamentally important realm, which is essential, highly functional, but also very much aesthetic in that it's about how it looks and what emotions it conjures up. And it's separate to the skills. It's, it helps in some ways, but it's separate to the skills of moving through the environment, um, you know, the park or the, the wrestling kinds of skills. Am I making some sort of sense here? Yeah, yeah. there's a few things that are intriguing to me there. One is the idea, um, this is stretching my mind, you know, or like I, I have to stretch to think about these things because music and, and rhythm and dance are not my native languages, right? I didn't mm. start trying to understand them as a mover until I was in my thirties. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, there's often this idea that music in some sense is it organizes information yeah. in a way that is very compelling and reflects certain things about nature, right? Yeah. Um, and we are inherently attracted to it because of something about that and and you know if we think about movement control like so that, so there's two elements here one is self-expression and the other is um is is actually like i'm thinking of this as like attunement to emotion mm -hmm. right so you express yourself through dance but what are you expressing you're expressing like kind of you're expressing you can express ideas but a lot of it is expression of an emotional state or, yeah. and and obviously these emotional states are very powerful and meaningful to us and they impact our movement right exactly. so for instance a a skilled dancer has the potential in a fight mm -hmm. to to have a more a deeper attunement in how to uh how to present aesthetically a a deceptive yes movement, yes right i yeah. can make my movement tell you something and you're always attuning to my yeah. my signals and if yeah. i have better ability to manipulate those signals as they're coming into you yeah then 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 all of a sudden i have gained this advantage and right. it teaches that it's it's like um if we could think of uh it's almost like it's like these are the layers there's the layer of the environment the physical environment mm. there's the layer of object 
things that you can manipulate and change. I, I obviously you can think of, of of objects as part of the environment, right? But we can distinguish. For me, there's a distinction between the environment that you move yourself on mm -hmm. and the environment that you move, mm -hmm. right? There's so I pick up the ball and move it. I swing yep. myself around the tree. That's my distinction. Yep. And then there's the opponent, right? Yep. Or the partner, the other moving living thing. Mm -hmm. So there's your layers. And then it's like the next layer is actually attunement to emotion in a sense. Yeah. And then related to that, but maybe not exactly the same because you don't have to have music to dance. Mm. It's attunement to music. Mm. And if you, if you ha are perceptually attuned across all of these layers, it's like, if I want someone to understand rhythm, mm. expressing it musically is one of the most powerful things, right? To, yep. to simply move to music intuitively, intuitively develops control of rhythm. Right. And control of rhythm is critical in everything that we do, right? Yep. One thing that I've been doing really, that I found very interesting recently is I have been, I've been counting in my head the steps that I take as I prepare for a jump. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's an interesting thing because I feel like I'm not sure that this would be a great idea for a beginner because I think that trying to control how many steps you take or trying to be attached to the steps could, could mislead you. Mm. But by simply marking in my head the feeling of the rhythm, I find that my rhythm self-organizes itself into a better state. Mm. Um, and you know, we've, we've talked about the fundamentals of, of, of flow in parkour as being your ability to control rhythm, your ability to control uh, direction of movement, right? If I'm trying to go that way and the movement that I did caused my body to fall this way, then it's a it's control error. Displacement, not going up and down more than necessary. Structure, how do I get my body into a position that allows me to continue to apply power, whatever the challenges are. And orientation, how do I make sure that I can always perceive where I am and where I need to go. Um, it can be very hard. It can be very hard for people to see rhythm, or to to understand rhythm. But when they're but people who who are musical have that automatically, right? Yeah. Like a dancer speaks a language of da da ba da da ba da da ka da. Right? And so I could be like, well, I did I did this thing, and it was like da da. Right. And they're like, yeah. Oh, I yeah. I can feel that in my body. I can try that. Yeah. And so if we think about this idea that we're that that good training is about a live or at least the center of our training because I do think that 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 drilling things has a role. There's a place for isolation, there's a place for pushing and just developing capacity and something. Mm -hmm. But it's that live open responded open loop responding to some set of these constraints. What is the environment? The tree. Okay, I'm trying to get there fast. The tree, I'm trying to move and play with the music and the tree and the rhythm and, the, right. and what I'm feeling emotionally yep. with a partner, right? Or I'm moving through the tree and this guy's trying to catch me and hit me. That, that starts to really, I think that's starting to, to integrate this and the role of dance. I, mm. I, I feel like I need to, to play with this idea more. Yeah, there's the, there's the element of, um, like of course there's the element of body control, mm -hmm. but I really think that, that the role of emotion is, is what's, so firstly, there's this thing of like, um, again, dance, evolutionarily evolutionarily one of the features of dance is again further attuning our senses to the environment mm -hmm. because again like that story of the day from your sit spot you know it has to be communicated but then that same thing of like the communication of all of the aspects of the environment through movement and gesture and 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 voice requires like if if the body has to learn to take on the shapes 
like if you were if you said to everyone in your sit spot okay you have to in your sit spot today when you come back you're going to have to describe 10 things and or events that happened non-verbally like and then when it's like and like people start off really goofy at this but then if they if you go and there's a really particularly twisted tree mm -hmm. or a particular thing and people go well you know at first people who are like shy or rigid or held up and not used to physically expressing like this they'll sort of try and do something with their hands yeah. but with practice people are able to contort their body into like beautiful shapes twisted shapes and realize that each little each little part of the body can add more of a twist add more detail to those shapes and we start to through taking on the shapes with our body we start to notice more detail of the shapes in the natural world or in the world around us so there's this whole mirror neuron system idea don't need to go into the um into the neuroscience of it uh, mm -hmm. today but there is this idea that the more strongly and there's there's a lot of research evidence supporting this the more strongly we can feel and take on those shapes in our own body the more we notice them in the world there's this whole idea that part of this animal mimicry stuff came from tracking when people and if you watch things like the great dance or the kalahari or talk to um people in in the central desert in australia where they'll say you know they'll say i saw a goanna over there and what they mean is they saw the tracks mm -hmm. but they'll say i saw a goanna he was walking this way and he was doing this and whatever and describe and they'll say over and over again you'll hear this thing of like we see the tracks and we feel in our body what the animal was doing. And so we do the dance of the animal to help us feel in our body better what the animal's feeling when we see the tracks. You know what I mean? So there's this like, it's cognitive, but the, the it's coming, it's being looped through the body feeling, through yeah, the body. Yeah. It's, uh... So that, that's the body control element. And then on top of that, we have the body control shapes and movements elements, but then on top of that, we have the emotional element. Because again, if it's a story, if it's if this has evolved from storytelling, and of course there's just the pure expressive, joyful, rhythmic element of dance as well. But I'm saying that dance and storytelling and and nonverbal communication have all evolved together. And this emotional content of like not just not just how does it feel physically, how does it feel emotionally? And what you can tell from the, the, you can tell by reading the response of whoever's being, whoever the audience is, whether they are emotionally resonating with this, this story that's being told as well. So when it's, so it's like the dance is attuning us evolutionarily, not just to the physical environment through copying the movements and taking on expressing the events of nature and the events of the world, but it's also attuning us emotionally to each other of like, oh, what did that person, not, not just what happened, but how did they feel when that happened? And then the person who's performing it is going, how are they feeling as I express this? Are they catching my emotion? You get what I'm saying? So it's, and then we see someone like Israel Adesanya again, and you go like, and all of these great strikers, like Adesanya, like, you know, Ali, like these people where it's like they're manipulating their opponent's emotional state and that's their that's their trick. They're rhythmically yeah, yeah. manipulating their exactly. opponent's emotional state. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 so I competed in jiu-jitsu for the first time last year, right? Mm. And um I, I I didn't I didn't study up on the rules of jiu-jitsu, so I didn't actually understand the point system. I was just going in there to try to tap the guy out. Uh so he swept me, so I, I got top position, and then he swept me twice, and uh -huh. so I lost the first two rounds. Uh, so we were the only two guys in our division. So we were, we're competing right. against each other. So we yep. three times in a row. So we get to Giants. the third, we get to the third, third round against each other. And, uh, and I was, I was so tired, right? Like this is the first time. And I started put, you know, we start grabbing each other, we start pulling him. And I, I just had this, this, this feeling all of a sudden that he was tired and that I was like, I, I will make you more tired than I am. Yeah. And I just, I just, I kind of poured myself into that moment. It was like, this is the last round. Like, I don't care. I will, imp I will impose my will. I know that you're, t I'm tired. I know that you're tired. I will make you more tired than me. Yeah. 
and I took him down. I passed his guard, and uh, he, he was funny. He had he had just like my foot stuck in in between his thing, right? And and I started. I, I think I may have like started faking like I was going for a collar choke, and he put his arm out, and like it was just it was over, right? It was like my moment was there. Bam, got that arm bar. Yeah, but there's so much about the perception. I had perceived the moment when he became weak emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. And so much of what you see in the UFC is, is that it's about you win the fight, not just because you hit the other guy harder. Sometimes that's why you win the fight. It's just a freak punch. But a lot of times it's that, that, that imposing your game and knowing, right. And you can see it. And, and um, you know, when Anderson Silva fought Adesanya, mm. right. He like there was this really interesting game before the thing, or maybe it wasn't a game, but Adas, uh, like Anderson Silva was like crying, right? And then you know Israel, who loves Anderson Silva, but has to go beat him, and fight him, right? He's like he's playing with me. I he's a, he's a trickster. I can't I can't let him control my emotions before the fight. Right. I can't right. let him impose the frame that you know he's this legend, and you know like I have to hold the frame that I'm here to take this. Uh huh. Um, so yeah, there's this beautiful aspect of, of that ability to, to, to manipulate and hold your emotional frame is actually yeah. the aspect of competing with another human being. Mm. And that, 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 that like a B-boy competition mm. is actually an extraordinarily training grounds for that. Right. So, um, let me tell you at, so we've, over the years, we've started adding more and more elements of storytelling to our work. Right. And initially it was stories from my own experience that I used to help people understand the concepts and the, the training methodology that we were sharing with them. And I found that when I shared stories, it was much more powerful for my audience than when I gave them scientific research. Right. Or, <laughs> and so I leaned into the stories and then I started trying to understand stories and I encountered Jordan Peterson's work. And then I started sharing these archetypal stories as a way of framing the central insights. And that was really powerful. And then, then we were really going into this idea of like, when you, when you, you know, you can, you can give a man a fish or you can teach him to fish, right? It was like insights that you derive yourself are often more valuable than insights that are given to you. So we started thinking, how do we get people to, to tell, tell the story themselves? And how do we like, not overwhelm them with information, like let the information be there and they can go find it. They can go find all my podcasts and all my blogs and all that stuff if they want it, but yeah. let them move and let them tell their story. And so we picked up from Mark Walsh, this, this pattern of for every, like a certain amount of movement, we'd have people get into groups or get into duos and dialogue for a minute about what their experience was and what their insights were. So they have yeah. to tell each other a story about what their experience just was. Awesome. Just like the sit spot story, right? Yeah. So we did that. And then, so we did that at Return to the Source last year. And then at this, at the fall retreat, we added this element where we were like, on the last night, we had all of the students divide into three groups that were like their tribes that, that while they were there, um, they like did dishes together and helped cook together and stuff like that. And we, on the last night, we, we asked them to tell the story of their experience at the retreat. Uh-huh. Right? So what is, what is the mythological version of what happened to you this weekend? Share it with Right. Them. Yeah. And so we had two groups that, like, did, uh, like, like, one group did a narrated story. So there was a physical aspect, and then someone was telling us. One group did a haiku. But then the last group did a physical story with no talking. They just nice. physically represented all of the salient moments. Yeah. And it was fantastic. And it was incredibly meaningful to the people. Mm. Like you could mm. just see everybody. So the faces light up. And my kids were there. And they were yeah. like having a ball with it, even though they hadn't been there to experience it. Right. So there's something very, very powerful about that. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's a really interesting thing. It's like, well, this aspect of storytelling is big. There's something else I really wanted to dig into there, but I've kind of lost it. Uh, so I don't know if you have something in what I just said that you want to run with for a little bit and maybe it'll come back to me. I think, um, I think just that 
that combination of elements of like the ability to express things physically is a, is a skill meaning like a contortionist or a, like someone who like has like really extraordinary body control and mobility and strength and a huge movement repertoire is potentially going to be able to through gesture convey a lot of uh, information about, you know, like if it was, if it was from, from return to the source or from one of your retreats, if they have those certain physical skills then they will be able to physically demonstrate a lot of the actual activities that took place. And if they have good contortion and shape shifting abilities, they'll be able to describe movements and so on that look a lot like animals, like trees, like, like doing a particular kind of vault over a park bench, which will, which will communicate to an audience who was there. You know what I mean? The people who were there will feel it most strongly, but the people who weren't there will get a whole lot of information of like, Oh, they were doing these kinds of things. I get it. So there's the physical skill, mm -hmm. but then there's concurrently, there's the skill of creating an emotional link with the audience or with another person. So it's not just, can I demonstrate physically what happened, but can I also convey my own emotional associations with what happened? Can I convey some of the emotional things of the entire group that were doing it? So I'm demonstrating not just my own emotions, but someone else's emotion, someone else's emotions. And we're even expressing at the same time, my emotional associations with two, like I might be expressing some stuff you did non-verbally. Yeah. And I'm like conveying this character of Rafe and, and I'm conveying how Rafe felt while he was doing it. Mm. But at the same time, I'm conveying how I, Simon, feel depicting how Rafe felt at that time. You know what I mean? There's this mm. whole, all this nuance and the creation of the link. Is this an audience who wasn't there? The setting the scene. Is this an audience who was there? And there's particular people in the audience who, who remember that moment and like the little things of like, creating that link so that the emotional information is flowing in both directions. Mm -hmm. And these are skills. These are fundamental skills that make us human, yeah. which are very much contained in dance as well as the physical information. That's what I think is really beautiful and amazing and important about dance and which can be missing in this like human development movement. Yeah. Like, okay. So uh, template that you're talking about. Yeah. There's a bunch. Okay, now I know what I wanted to talk about, and there's there's right. so much that like we can go back to that. Yeah, you know, we're, we have to wrap this conversation in a couple of minutes, so we're gonna have to like get right back to this because there's a whole. I feel like we just opened the, the door to a new conversation, but but here's the things that occurred to me as you were talking about that. So number one is, as far as I know, humans are the only primates that dance and that sing, right? I mean, I guess gibbons sing. It's maybe a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I mean, sing definitely yeah. um but it, it's quite an interesting thing right you know like the level of song that we engage in is something that you see almost only birds do so so i was thinking about john verveke's idea of psychotechnologies uh -huh. you know, as these things came to us or, or we discovered or, or dug into these things as psychotechnologies that gave us specific abilities that that what you're talking about, this animal, animal mimicry aspect of, of theater and movement, mm. is actually a psychotechnology that, that profoundly impacted our ability to, to predict the action of our prey. Yes. And, and that leads me to this idea that, so we're trying, we, what we want to create from a movement perspective is better movement problem solvers, let's say, mm -hmm. right? We, we talked about this idea that patterns aren't where it's at. It's about the solutions, right? So part of that is, is perception action coupling. But another thing that like uh, Steve Morris, who we both admire a lot, talks about is predictive processing, right? Mm. Most of what we're responding to isn't even information that actually exists. It's information that we're predicting will exist based on all of this other stuff. Yeah. So when, when the, 
when the hunter forager is dancing the guana, he is engaging in a kind of predictive processing where he's coupling action to this predicted perception in a way that attunes him to the way that guanas move, yep. the way that they behave such that he can solve a problem, which is how do I hunt that guana? And if we think about, about movement as problem, or we think about the goal of these training practices in general as essentially becoming better problem solvers. Well, what are the problems that we have to solve? Mm. Right? Is not the emotional aspect of this, the self-expressive aspect of this, an extraordinarily deep and and it's not just it's not just like oh that's also important it's like that's actually also layered into all these other things it's like if i have better emotional control of myself through exposing myself to expressing these emotions through my body when i stand to do the jump can i can i get a an action coupling emotional coupling that will help me shift myself into the state that makes me appropriately prepared to do the jump, right? Does the dancing actually make me more cognitively, emotionally fluid to break out of the fear state that's going to prevent me from accomplishing that or doing it well, mm -hmm. right? Just like in the fight, it's like, if I can, if I can control my frame, if I can, if I can express my body in such a way that that creates the perception that I want in your head and the perceptions that I want in my head and not allow yeah. the opposite to me, I have this great advantage. So I don't know. I, I, I'm extraordinarily excited by how this links all these ideas. And I think that, uh, I think that the one thing that we haven't gone as deep into in this conversation as we did in the last conversation and that we want to do more of is how that links us to this broader story of how the practices grow you as a human being. Right. And so I, I, we are, I have another call that I have to get on in two minutes. Um, so what I'd love to hear is your response to just what I just articulated, and then maybe a preview for the audience of where you see this conversation going in that broader conversation of not just a, how do I become a better problem solver to, potentially track down a guana or jump through a tree or fight somebody, but for the things that are actually more relevant to most people's lives. <sighs> Is that too much to ask of you? It's, you know, like, I, 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 I don't know if I can like, you know, come up with a, a pithy thing that sums it all up in a nutshell. Um, but we have to get off in exactly two minutes. Just share what's going but on. One of, one of the things that like, you know, that really does, does come to mind in, in like how all this stuff fits is like in terms of uh, you know the whole theory of affordances and like what what opportunities is my environment offering me at any given moment and then um, movement skill coming you know in all of like you were talking about team sports earlier and how like you know there's a there's all this great stuff showing that like the, the best team sport players, like what's um, making them exceptional in many, many, many cases is not that they're faster or stronger or better at, um, you know, getting the ball in the hoop or whatever it might be. What, sh what shows them as being remarkable is their predictive ability yep. that they're predicting the movements of all of the other people on the court and that's allowing them to be in the right place at the right time. It's not that they're faster in getting there. It's just that they're predicting better. So um, then with, you know, to tie that into this thing of, of dance and emotion, of like the attunement to the emotional environment, realizing that we're attuned to, like we're, we're predicting, when we're, we're not just perceiving the emotional field of all the other people that we're with, we're predicting the emotional consequences of all of the options spreading out from this particular moment. So we're continually predicting the consequences for us, the consequences for them. How will I feel if this, how will I feel if that, how will they feel if they see me this? So there's this predictive, yeah, this predictive emotional realm, but then one of the 
the amazing things evolutionarily again with depicting through dance and through gesture all of the things in the environment and how that attunes us to the shapes and movements of the environment and the attunes us to the movements of the animals and so on is because that's wrapped up in emotion in the storytelling of it that's part of again there's a lot of speculation about this of being that being part of this innate human tendency for anthropomorphism and perceiving the world as emotional mm -hmm. and this is reduced in our culture currently but massively massively expressed in every indigenous culture that i know of in which all of these practices are still fundamental where it's like of course and who cares scientifically about the the, the truth of this but there's this sense there's this sense that the world is aware that the world is responding not just through movement but through emotion and so there's this um this responding to the world as if it's emotional and predicting the emotional responses of the animals, of the people, of everyone, that that loop, that feedback loop of perceiving, expressing through our bodies, this emotional realm, that is potentially a huge part of the, the building blocks of our, of our consciousness itself. You know what I mean? We're not just predicting each other's movements. We're, we're doing this really, really, really complex layer upon layer of like, every behavior that I could potentially do in this moment, what's going to be the emotional response of my peers, particularly of my own species, of my partner, or of my, of my children, but then of all of, all of the world. So this theory of mind yeah. thing, that this stuff, you know, the, the book, I don't know if you've read it. I think it's called The Lost Art of Tracking and the Origins of Science. I haven't. It's definitely on my, my to-read list. On the list. Right. So there's all this stuff that, that dance and gesture and all of these things that, that our very theory of mind evolved from these practices that we're talking about now. So that's, you know, and it's, it's very much speculative, but it's extremely entertaining speculation um, for me at least. So I don't know if that even had anything to do with what you were just <laughs> saying, but it's like, you were thinking about this and that made me think about this. So um, yeah, that's why this has been such an interesting conversation. Um, yeah. What you're saying made me think about like, uh, Malanjingo or uh, Malicia in, um, in Capoeira yeah, as well, right? The, the yeah. idea of this manipulation of the emotional field and the play as being mm. a place where you're learning the sophistication. Mm. Um, yeah, and it also, it, it leads into this idea of, of, of practices as places where we, we cultivate the art of being human. Mm. And, and I, I want to dig into that and I want to dig into there's so much out there now never before has the you know the practices of every culture in some sense been available to anyone who wants to pick them up and pick and choose among them but it's a it's an endless field mm. we have to have a guide we have to have some guides to try to pick this up and there's a lot of stuff that's um that's decrepit or corrupt or you know um coming from a you know like uh based on some some misperceptions, right? Uh, so there's many, many great combinations of practices or ecologies of practices, but having a better map to what the, what, what the central pieces need to be of that ecology of practice, and then what some very great starting points are, and what, what you're looking for to see if you're getting the best out of those. I think that would be a good place to pick up this conversation next time. Cool. Yeah. Simon. Sounds good. It's uh it's always a pleasure. I thought this was one of the most enjoyable chats we've had. My yeah. brain is buzzing now. Nice. In another way than it was buzzing before. It's very buzzy. So yeah. uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Let's let's try to uh to do this again like within the month and you know, not wait a year. Yeah. Cool man. Thanks, Ray. Adios. Thanks for listening to the Evolve Move Play podcast. If you want to support what we're doing, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and hit that notifications button so you know what's coming up. And of course, the biggest support you can give is to become a Patreon supporter. This is what's going to allow us to grow this platform more than anything else. So this is entirely listener supported and we really appreciate your support and we look forward to talking to you again soon.